Hi, Elliot. Hi, Danielle. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How about you? I'm great. I guess we're recording um, for the 23rd of February, 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. King County Libertarian Party local news commentary. We have a website. It's lpkingcounty.com if you are interested in keeping up to date on all things libertarian in King County. We should update that website. (laughs) It's as updated as it can be right now. As of right now, yeah. Yeah. We will update it moving forward. (laughs) Don't forget to hit the bell to subscribe or something like that, too. People say that. No, that's only on YouTube. No, no, no. Yeah, we are on YouTube. That's where I uploaded this. Oh, yeah. So you have got to hit like and subscribe and hit the bell button to get routine notifications. Yeah, duh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right? Well, I don't know. I'm not a great good millennial. I don't know how any of this works. I watch YouTube. It's my only way. Okay. So we've assimilated all things YouTube. And now we're going to talk about, (laughs) um, we've got elections coming up, specifically city council, county council, mayor, city attorney, public health, oh, there, and then there's some measures, recall, savant, recall, Mayor Durkin. People are really not stoked about the current uh, people in office, huh? No. No, um, and then we wanted to talk about the democracy vouchers, too, so I can list off who's eligible for those. But there are a ton, so actually, you should go to seattle.gov slash democracy voucher, and uh, that should take you right to the page, and then you can figure out if if you have any candidates that you're eligible to donate to. Well, who would you, like, not be eligible to donate to? Anyone that wasn't... Uh, that didn't apply. So, for example, oh, right, right. the socialist Sawant, she yes. chose to not participate in democracy vouchers because she knew she'd raise more private funds if she did not because there's a cap on uh, contributions if you use democracy vouchers. She's really not uh, – she's opting not for the centralized uh, money distribution option. Correct, at least as of the last election. Anti-fairness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she did not like the socialist solution to – the the democracy matters. making voting more fair. I mean, one could also argue that maybe she's uh, relying more on the international workers of the world. Maybe, hmm. yeah, she's, maybe her most of her donations didn't come from Washington State. It's entirely possible. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe it came from like Russia. Much like the the current uh, Washington <laughs> State Insurance Commissioner, too. Actually, right? Don't most of his donations come from out of state? Wow, that wouldn't surprise me at all, though. Don't I mean, me none of them. Way. None of them would surprise me. Like, I mean, all all state politics is pretty much funded from uh, externally. I mean, uh, yeah. we're, we're tracking candidates, guys. We promised we would track the candidates, and this is a track. Oh, you know what? We don't have anyone to endorse yet. They uh, <laughs> they didn't. Uh, they're, they're not going to hear those episodes. So we we agreed, like an episode two, that didn't air, um, that uh, we're going to just track the candidates that are local to us, and uh, just just go through. And track them week by week. Mm-hmm. So we've introduced them. You have been informed. These are the people running for those positions. Yeah. I don't have any really good information about anyone quite yet. Because they haven't, like, half of them don't have websites. So maybe we'll do a special. Yeah, we can do, like, a website read or something. Yeah, yeah. Election night. If only we had a Patreon, we could... Oh my goodness. Patreon need, only that one. We need a Patreon so bad. <laughs> but, Feel free to give me money and I'll read that for you. you right? That's a... <laughs> give it give it to the party. We should do a party Patreon that way. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um yeah, so <laughs> this was my favorite headline, so we're doing it second, obviously. <laughs> uh, a woman needing a hobby discovers narcotic stash in thrift store finds. Now, let me tell you what hobby. Okay, because my hobby from this website, I'm assuming, is narcotics, right? It's like, oh my god, I came in here for knitting, and I found actually what my dream was, but go ahead. You're close. It was a crochet kit. Okay. Um, That was the hobby, though. Oh, okay. Crochet was the hobby. It wasn't like cocaine was the hobby? No, narcotics were just the surprise. In a crochet kit? Yes. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's a good way of doing that. It was it was in a kit to crochet animal hats that she purchased from Goodwill. Wait, hats for animals or hats out of animals? 
uh, probably hats that look like animals, oh, like a, like okay. a brown beanie, beanie with maybe some brown Their ears, ears or whatever. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah that's animal my hats. Guess. All right, yeah, the, no, that the makes picture sense. is just of the drugs. Though. Of the drugs, they, they, they really know what the what everybody cares about is yeah. the drugs. Part it was a suspiciously the... heavy item encased in yellow rubber that gave off an odd odor, and said one hundred percent. Yeah, that's a lie. It's not one hundred percent. Hundred percent crochet. <laughs> no lying here. Um, so, oh, who was that reported by? I should say that was the SPD blotter. Okay. All right. So next up from Cairo Seven, anti-Asian hate crimes continue in Seattle and across the United States. Um. Basically, this can be summed up as a, a few Asians. I mean, about nine per year back in 2016 were reported hate crimes against Asian folks. Um, up to as most as recently as October of 2020, 42 hate crimes had been reported. So that's over a hundred percent increase. And um, folks are it really the. The really annoying thing about this is that it seems like it's all tied to COVID still. People still believe that Chinese folks brought COVID here. And so some things they'll say is that it's all your fault because you're Chinese or Chinese people need to be put back in their place. As if, like, the, the, the Chinese people living here right now in America, like, have all direct ties back to China. I mean, it's just completely ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like, it, uh, I don't get, like... Um, the whole like World War Two, you know, every single Japanese person in America is pro Japan. Japan, it's like, uh, no, they moved here, man. Like for the most part, when people move to America, they are not trying to be where they're from, right? Not to say that people like hate on the cultures that they came from forever, but it's just the thing. Like if most of the time, if you move to America, you're you're putting your nickel down here. You're not putting it back over there as well, right? I mean, like they're anyway. The point being is like it just doesn't make sense, and it seems like people just gotta have an out it for the most part but um that that outlet is just completely misguided in this case and uh, it doesn't make sense to take it out you know whatever anger you have on random asian people in this case i mean like you know did they like make the virus in your head like did they uh you know are they chinese communist party members who are like high ranking and like you know uh, it just doesn't make sense even if that was the case right even if that is true that that's exactly you know if it was even if it was a manufactured virus right it's not going to be like random asian people here in america just that walking did that. down the street these are just normal folks just walking down the street one lady was like pushed off the sidewalk no, and, and this, uh, it kind of gets to a point that's like a, a broad, it's not really a libertarian point per se, but it is a broad theme that many libertarians um, have, which is this notion of collectivism. You know, I mean, like the, the even the term libertarianism for most libertarians is pretty, uh, a, a pretty on edge thing because we don't like the idea of defining individuals in terms of a collective um it just doesn't lead to good results because each person is genuinely unique which means if they are unique then to put them into a collective means that you're reducing them to something that you know you're you're, you're starting to strip away bits of them that are the bits that make them unique as a person so i don't know anti-collectivism don't do it from King 5, I have one year later, Seattle small business owners are out of options. Um, specifically, he's talking about businesses who were that were closed due to COVID. Um, one place that they interviewed called Queen Mary Tea Room, they have done everything they can to really stay in business. They've canceled their phone and internet services. They had to lay off some employees who ended up going on unemployment. Um, and at this point, they're, they're, they are able to provide delivery, but like many restaurants, they're saying it doesn't make sense for their businesses to even be open right now because 25% capacity requires more staff than they're going to make. Um, in, in, in revenue to pay. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's tea is, yeah. it's not, it's not like you're selling like a steak or anything. It's like, how much are you going to charge per tea? Right. 
Right. And so uh, I believe in another article I saw over 90 businesses in the area have closed because of COVID. So... And of course, you know what businesses haven't closed because of COVID? It's going to be the Walmarts. It's going to be the Fred Myers. It's going to be all the big, the Costco's. I mean, I, every weekend I rub elbows with a whole huge bunch of people at a Costco, right? I mean, like they're, they're usually, I mean, come on. Like, is that really 25% capacity? You know, everybody filling up the entire, uh, you know, parking lot every single weekend? I think not, right? So somehow they get a waiver, right? Because they're quote essential, but the local tea person does not get a waiver. I mean, it's, it's clear cronyism every single time yeah and unfortunately it is the middle class normal folks that are being damaged because of Mm -hmm. these policies and and a lot of folks just don't even realize it because they're so afraid of a virus that Mm -hmm. is gonna kill people Mm -hmm. has killed people yes Mm -hmm. but so does poverty and so Um, does depression and all of these other things that are coming out of these lockdowns and and you know uh, it's not that libertarians are against businesses going out of business i mean that's that you know creative destruction is a very important part of a free and open market but this is not the creative destruction that comes about when say consumers suddenly hate tea right it's not that they this tea shop has failed to keep up with uh, consumer preferences uh, that has suddenly turned against tea. It's from a top down imp- imposition of this is how you have to run your business. Um, and of course, the, the I don't know about necessarily in Washington if the rules have been perfectly consistent or not. But in many states, uh, I know California in particular, the rules have changed all over the place, and so literally businesses have not been able to keep up. And so uh, you know. This is not market creative destruction. This is just normal destruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And on that note, it is Black Restaurant Week, which runs February 19th through 28th. Um, You can see a list of restaurants at blackrestaurantweeks.com slash northwest. Or just go on DuckDuckGo and search blackrestaurantweeks.com. And if you don't know what DuckDuckGo is, Google it. Uh, yeah, Google it the first time, and then don't Google past that. Make it your default. <laughs> now, um, I'm really excited about a couple of these places uh, that are going to be that that are participating in Restaurant Week, which generally is. Wait, so what's what's Black Restaurant Week? Restaurant Week, um, in general, is. Restaurants have a specific menu that's offered for folks that wouldn't normally eat at that place. So they can have just kind of a tasting menu to see if they like them enough to come back. And these are a promotional price generally. Mm. um, Is it always in February recently? Previously. So this is the first year, actually, of um, Black Restaurant Week here in Seattle. But it was, I think it started in Texas or something. Oh, oh, so it's like another month or something. And but then here they're doing it during Black History Month for Black businesses. I'm not sure what the month was originally. Okay, but okay, February makes sense. Well, no, of course February makes sense for yeah, because Black History Month and all that. Yeah. Um, Well, that's really exciting. Yeah, so um, we're going to, oh yeah, it's very exciting. So I love Restaurant Week because I get to try new restaurants at an affordable price Mm -hmm. that are curating a menu for me so that I know what to try because I, that's one thing that I actually really miss for up COVID is Mm. (laughs) all the restaurants being closed. So um, these places are actually using Grubhub for their delivery, which seems great, so um, go participate, order from these folks this week, and try something new. So, like, what are some of the rest? What are the options here? I mean, I want to know. I gotta go. Yes, yes. So we've got some Ethiopian food, delicious Ethiopian cuisine. Try me Ethiopian cuisine. Um, I think you and I, Elliot, we talked about yod style Jamaican cuisine. Oh yeah, we got. I have no idea. I mean, like you were saying something about Cajun or whatever, but I have no idea about Jamaican like yeah. food or anything. So yeah. So if any of you listening have any suggestions, go to blackrestaurantweeks.com. Check out what's available here uh, in the Northwest, and drop us a comment if you've tried any of these places and you think we should try it, or um, if you want to hear our review on any next week. Oh my goodness, this is gonna be so good. 
Oh, this is part of like our culture section. We had like our politics section, then we had our culture section. Oh yeah, I got you with the culture. Oh my goodness, so cultured. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but there are also some new restaurants opening in Seattle, so um, celebrate Black Restaurant Week this week, but next week maybe try to go to some of these new places, um, or maybe tell me which ones you want me to try. Uh, we've got uh, Boteco Brazil, I okay. guess. Uh, Flavory Lao Bowl, a uh, top pot. In a bowl. Uh, What's hot pot? Uh, it's meat that is generally cooked in a very hot broth right at the table, I, I think. Oh, at the table? Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Well, I guess you would know because you haven't been yet, huh? Yeah, so uh, maybe there we should go. There we should go, we'll yeah, and then we'll, 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 we'll report back. Um, I don't <laughs> You're know intrepid you... reporters. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we'll report from the field. Real journalists. <laughs> Uh, Guy Fieri is opening a Flavor Town kitchen, which I, I just wanted to say that. I'm not going to eat there. Actually, I'm, I don't have a problem with there. I, just... I feel like I'd want to go to Lunchbox Lab <laughs> over that. I don't know. I don't know. We're going to Flavor Town, guys. Like, yeah, it's fun to say. Maybe I will do it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, if you like sandwiches, there's Martino's. That was good. Yes, yeah. And if you go, uh, well, I'll I'll help post the links below in the description. In the description. So click on click on this link, the Seattle PI article for these new restaurants. Ooh, and are you ready to click on the link? Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell to get our notifications. Yeah, and then visit us on lbkcounty.com. <laughs> Ding. Anyways, that's the bell sound. Um, Ding. Yeah, so leave us ooh and there's sushi blossom. I'm happy with any of these. So if you want to suggest one of the restaurants from either of these lists for us to try this week and report on later, let us know because I love food and I need reasons to go eat more of it. There you go. There you go. Uh, according to K U O W, Seattle Public Schools delays reopening plans as teachers' union agreement stalls. Um, basically, the teachers' union is saying that uh, they won't agree to coming back to work at the moment because the few teachers that are holding in-person classes, specifically in like special education, um, they're not getting the PPE that they believe that they need in order to conduct class. So the teachers' union is saying if you can't even provide... Uh, protective equipment for the minimal teachers that are there now. There's no way you're going to be able to provide enough for the full staff. If there was ever a time, I mean, I know that people have slowly started to figure out that maybe we don't need people to physically go into school all the time, right? But if there was ever a time to start transitioning away from centralized schooling, now is the time. And you know what kills me is that, you know, The one word that I think is appropriate to apply to modern conservatives slash Republicans is reactionary because that's actually the defining thing that defines them, right? They only react to the action. So, for instance, you know, these same people would tell you that the schools teach uh, things that are against their values, right, and and from a religious point of view, say, for the religious wing, that are have a liberal bent, right, that, that exclude, uh, you know, sort of a conservative take on history in a lot of ways, especially in the Seattle area, um, and that the teachers in a lot of ways are against sort of or, or opposing their interests as parents because the schools and the teachers' union uh, put the teachers' needs first, uh, perhaps above the kids slash the parents' needs, right? And so, How do these people get off on suddenly demanding that their kids get sent back to this same institution, right? And, um, you know, to attack this whole thing from the other side, uh, a Twitter person that I follow called at uh, Lesser Goldfinch, uh, L-E-S-S-E-R-G-O-L-D-F-I-N-C-H, like the bird, uh, said, imagine knowing that government education was used to wipe out entire indigenous cultures and then advocating for government education. And that's what, like, everyone is doing right now. I mean, education in – it, like, literally was, was, was produced by the Prussians originally and then adopted by the Americans and other imperial powers around the world to allow for their imperial empires both to indoctrinate – 
uh, the children and assimilate cultures that are different than the imperial culture and to brainwash the children into working uh, meaningless factory jobs at the time, right? Now, of course, I'm pro, like, work and all that stuff. I'm not against factory work per se, but the school system has specifically been used for millennia, or not millennia, for decades or for centuries at this point. Centuries is the right time scale. Um, to crush dissenting opinion and to crush the minds of children into a society that does not necessarily benefit them. And so, you know, it's time to be done with schooling as we understand it and jump right to education. So that's, that's my thoughts. Yeah. And I, I think that one thing that really concerns a lot of people when you say stuff like and education uh, is that we do want children to have a minimal standard of things that they're learning, reading, mm-hmm. writing, arithmetic, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so, um, while I do, I love the idea of, of homeschooling and private schooling and public schooling and co-op schooling and mm-hmm. however you want to do it, um, mm-hmm. but I... I, I do kind of appreciate that there is that minimal standard, and I would like to see that reworked at least maybe on a state level. Mm-hmm. Um, but without all the weird things like the yeah. Duwamish tribe not being included in curriculum because it's not a technically a yeah, tribe yeah. or whatever nonsense um, like that. I feel like stuff like that nitty gritty content should be debated at the mm-hmm. school level. But and I think I think it's totally reasonable to demand a minimum standard of schooling, just like we all demand a minimum standard of nutrition uh, nutrition out of our food, right? And a minimum standard of safety out of our car. Right. Um, The thing is, is that as it stands right now, the schools that we as we and I make a distinction between school and education, you know, just me personally anyway. And it it seems to me that schools are meant to, you know, I mean, when, when you send a kid all the way through high school. They're not ready for the workforce, not even by a little bit. They have to go to college, right? And even then, they might not even uh, have the credentials that they need to make it in the workplace because when you get in the workplace, there's certifications that you need, right? Like, So I'd love to see schooling either retooled towards actual education, right? Or retooled towards actually preparing people for the workforce, but as it is, it does neither, right? Because or, Americans or even just adulting. Yeah, even just, right. I didn't like learn how to change a tire until I had a flat tire on the side of the road. Mm-hmm. And and, and so it seems to me that the, the the key thing that the schooling system does right now is make people feel as if they are educated without actually educating them, and that is like the primary good that the majority of schools and and I mean that we have the stats right we have the data <laughs> that American schools do worse out of the developed world right on um, just about every direction. So I mean. Yeah, anyway. And standardized testing is not the answer. I just don't no, know what it definitely is. Not. I feel like maybe educators have that answer if someone would like to ask them, though. Because mm-hmm. it seems like people haven't been asking them when they've been making changes to educational standards. Mm-hmm. It's it's sort of similar to, like, medicine, right? How there's, a, there's, there's several intermediaries in between the people buying the good, the healthcare, and the people providing the goods to doctors, right? And so you get a lot of funky... Um, you, know, you get a lot of funky incentives when you have the government and then insurance companies standing in between uh, healthcare providers and people who are patients, right? And and the same sort of uh, sort of Hayekian central knowledge problem applies here, where if teachers were more directly accountable, schools more in particular were more directly accountable to the parent base, then I think you would see far better outcomes, uh, standardized testing or no. I mean, like I, I'm not necessarily going to step in anybody's, um, you know, particular, uh, area and, uh, require specifics cause I'm not experts in those areas. Right. But I, I, I do feel like I, and I know that, uh, the, you know, in general, when you put the, the, the people who are buying the good closer to the people selling the good, you tend to have better outcomes in general. Now, this is my hot take. <laughs> there you it's go. not a hot take. Hot this take. This is my, I don't know. Spicy a take? Watch. No. Um, <laughs> Jill Biden, Dr. Uh-huh. Jill Biden, okay. her degree is in education, I believe. So I am interested to see if anything comes out of the White House. Um 
using her skills and knowledge and presumably abilities. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll presumably see how that goes. Skills? I mean, well, I would hope so. I mean, I she, she's a doctorate sure in education. I mean, you'd think uh-huh. at that point. I don't know. <laughs> she's not a dentist, so I see. <laughs> <laughs> Seattle's controversial property defense proposal stalls out. So the property defense proposal would have extended legal defenses for poor, mentally ill people accused of a misdemeanor. Um, So it it would have helped folks with have more of a defense if they fell into certain categories. when they had a misdemeanor, presumably things that are associated with mental health diagnoses and poverty and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they would have more of a chance to tell their story in court before any decisions were made. Um, So to just get the, like the extenuate, the full picture, the extenuating circumstances maybe, right? Like, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, And, and I know that in like a lot of, in criminal court a lot, they'll want to use, um, a defense like a character witnesses mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so if a defendant brings in a character witness then that opens the prosecution up to bring in character witnesses and so then, yeah and like, then they can I might character say, assassinations exactly so i could say you know i go to church every day mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. whatever I a, a food kitchen before, or whatever yeah but if i was a jerk to one person then they're and like that oh my goodness that's a really good story right that could also come in front of the court now I don't know how this specifically is structured, but I know that that is a, a fear of folks when they're in court is they don't want to tell their full story mm-hmm. because the more they talk, the more they implicate themselves, first of all. Mm-hmm. Um, and then second of all, they open themselves up to all these little loopholes that let the prosecution bring more defense. Well, it's or, like or wait, whoever wait. the, the um, accuser yeah, the, is, not necessarily a It's like um, every, everything that you talk about is open you know open for cross-examination type mm-hmm. of thing right yeah. like whereas if you don't talk about it maybe you have a stronger case to say ah, we're not talking about that yes and so um one thing that obviously helps is that there are statistics showing that there is a racial disparity of folks who cannot afford legal defense and mm. and so because this is now a race issue i think we're going to see Things change a little bit, which it, this is my one my one really big thing that I want public money going into is a fair and just court system. So mm-hmm. um, if the court system is looking at something that's going to help people defend themselves against accusations like this, I am I am for spending our money on it. And I mean, um, yeah, like like uh, there, there's there's too many laws to begin with. Yeah. And it should be much easier. I mean, I, I, in my mind, it, it, the 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 best way to, to solve this would be to either repeal the laws or fully nullify the laws or, you know, everybody just agrees that these laws are stupid and we're not going to deal with them anymore, right? Like, that, that could be too. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we don't uh, – there, there are plenty of crazy laws on the book from like the 18 whatever the hecks, right? And uh, we don't enforce those anymore, so why do we enforce stupid laws now? Right, no, no dumb laws ever enforced, ever convicted. I mean, the judge could go through the whole rigmarole and say, "No, case dismissed. I don't want to hear it. This is a stupid case," mm-hmm. you know. And every judge up the line could do that, you know, all the way to the Supreme Court, and they could actually enforce the Constitution for once. But they're not gonna. So, you know, I'm not gonna take a, a sort of, you know, boomer take on that one. But what I will say is, uh, laws are dumb. Um, dumb laws are dumb. How about that? Yeah, and I, I think you're right. And this kind of goes back to the bicycle helmet mm. law that we were talking about last week. Consistency. Where, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, there are so many laws on the books, and many of which were put in place to keep certain demographics down. But mm-hmm. I think in the bicycle mm-hmm. helmet law, it really was just... A, it's pretty obvious in that case. Yeah, it was just people, you know, wanting to... to do uh, what they they wanted to keep other people safe people mm-hmm. cared about other people they wanted to educate them on the risks of mm-hmm. riding a bike without a helmet and then they enforced enforced these laws now that are targeting homeless people and people of color and, and i can't believe like when when people are you know saying that that the system is racist uh, the cops are you know systemic racism well in my mind the correct response to that is 
we got to have a moratorium on passing any laws until we fix this problem. No new Full laws. Full stop. I think no that's a new thing. laws. I think right? That's a thing. Is that a thing? I all right. Well, I'm a fan of that because I'm. I mean, the libertarian solution to all of this stuff is no new laws. Because let's be clear, everything is already illegal, right? Like, there's five felonies a day at the federal level, right? I mean, it's impossible to do anything legal in, in, in today in America. Um, and there's plenty of state level laws. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but murder is already illegal, right? I mean, this is a standard 2A argument, but it's true, you know? So, um, yeah, no new laws, man. We don't need them. Well, I think it's no new crimes and I can't oh, find it now, but I, okay. will, I will find it for next well, week. Well, we'll get it for next week then because yeah, yeah no new crimes. Get rid of it. Oh, you're going to love this, oh. Elliot. Yep. Uh, Washington lawmakers look to fix climate. While solving the housing crisis. Okay. Basically, there are two bills in the state House of Representatives. Uh, One is HB 1099. The brief description is improving the state's climate response through updates to the state's comprehensive planning framework. Uh, the other is HB 1157. The brief description is increasing housing supply through the Growth Management Act and housing density tax initiatives for local governments. Um, the 1157, this one does establish a real estate excise tax, uh, but it um, provides zoning restrictions, more lax zoning restrictions, so that uh, more areas can be zoned for multifamily housing. So at least six net dwellings per acre is what they're hoping for. And then they want to ensure that housing is properly planned for, which we all know that planning is not a word that Seattle government knows, so I don't know why that's in this bill, but... (laughs) Uh, they, they, well, they love to plan and then not, like, actually plan. Yeah, Seattle's a very poorly planned city, for those of you who haven't actually been in it. It's, it's since <laughs> since its inception. It's it, continually mm-hmm. over and over again. P- poorly planned. Um, yeah, so uh, part of this, part of why folks want... L M fifty seven obviously is we want less zoning restrictions so that we can ha- you know increase housing density because a lot of people want to live here so we want to have more units for people to live in if they want to live here right like that's the whole mm-hmm. point. Um, the yeah. Th- yeah, the thing that kills me is like um, I see I see it, what I feel like is uh, I guess like so with with. Natural gas, that's a line that goes to the house, right? It's kind of like plumbing or something like that. Is that like a centralized thing or is it a thing that I have somebody fill up my natural gas tank next to my house? Natural gas comes from a utility from the street. Um, Some people have them like coming out of their house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That kind of makes me less, less, less upset about this. I mean, like I saw it, it, it's slightly related. I saw that in the whole Texas fiasco winter, winter storm problem that happened down there that the homeowners that had the best time out of it were the ones that were using that are, that are hooked into the test. Tesla power packs. My boy. Yeah, yeah. Daniel's Daniel's got stock in Tesla. Um, full, full disclosure. Um, and uh, it's SpaceX when it comes out. Heck yeah, let's go. Um, so here's the thing, though, is that I'm all about getting out of utilities, right? I feel like we had a huge, pro- you know, it was the wrong move to go down centralized utilities in the 1900s, and that the 21st century is an era where we can decentralize all those utilities and just use power that is home by home based. That way you don't have to worry about power outage because it's just localized to your home, right? So, you know, insofar as obviously I don't want the state mandating new regulations, at the same time, I don't want the state providing centralized uh, natural gas um, plumbing, so to speak, right? And that's actually part of this plan is to build, so it, 
uh, homes built, quote, greener or more, uh, more dependent on electrical power, they cost a little bit more to build, but overall save homeowners and renters money. So they're talking about just how, you know, any, any requirements to have these things will in the long run be better for people. But the question is, you know, do we want to mandate that people are doing these things? I, I like the environment as much as everyone else, but maybe that extra ten to $100,000 price tag isn't going to work for me. Yeah. So there you go. Um, but I do appreciate that the city and the government are, are at least in, in HB 1099, it looks like they really are trying to address the impact of climate change and, and how the government is using power. So having a, a green-minded government and, and replacing different kinds of things and building new things in different ways from a government standpoint sounds great to me. I just don't think the government should be telling everybody what to do. Agreed. Uh, well, because there's no reason, I mean, uh, again, since they shouldn't be doing centralized utilities in the first place, I think that uh, you just declare, hey, we're not going to provide any more natural gas to the buildings. You don't have to declare a mandate saying you must. You just have to say, we're not going to support it anymore. That's what software does all the time, right? As, as uh, That's what free and open source software, they'll say, hey, we're going to deprecate this functionality. It's not going to be supported. If you want to maintain it yourself, then feel free, right? But uh, we're just not going to do it. And that's definitely a way that it could be done. It's, it's like crazy because there's so many ways in which the state is currently propping up so many different industries right now. And if environmentalism is one of the things that you value, then just have the state stop propping it up, right? I mean, the oil market only works because we send people to go get it through endless forever wars. Yeah. And by people, he means soldiers. Yeah, 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 exactly. And military firepower and whatnot. Yeah, like our veteran Danielle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I did that, I guess. Um, now, another thing that I actually super appreciate that has nothing to do with government regulation or anything is oh, just let's see, that's a simple. challenge. It's simple and logical. No. <laughs> the less people commute, the mm. better it is for the environment. So, again, this increasing the amount of um, single-family homes that can be per acre in these different zoning rules, that is going to decrease commuting because people, because there will be more housing, will be able to afford to live closer to work. There and therefore, go. there will be less gas emissions. And when people live in the city, they drive less anyways because mm -hmm. things are within walking distance. Mm -hmm. Although Seattle is one of those uh, so very high-ranking cities for homeowner or car ownership. Yeah, yeah. Well, when because like you can't because our our. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. I just railed against public utilities, and I will continue to rail against public utilities. But the reason why we, you have to have a car here is because like the the pub the the public transit we have is terrible. It's a dream compared to Omaha. Let me tell you. Well, fair enough. But like in Midwestern states, you're not going to have really good. I mean, they're spread out, man. It's just, give them a break. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give Seattle. I'll give the bus credit. The but bus you, can't. We'll but get you, know you there what? eventually, like three hours know, later. I don't own a helmet, so I can't ride a bike. So. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Ugh. Gross. Uh, now we're going to end on a positive note because I really also like movies, so this is why I'm included in this podcast. Because <laughs> um, Daniel is cultured. Yes, <laughs> I'm only rants, no culture. Somehow I ended up as the culture correspondent. Who knew? Uh, that's pretty embarrassing for the two of us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There, there's a film festival called Spliff, and I'm sure that I saw what that stood for at some point. Oh, it's, well, Spliff don't. is like uh, when you mix uh, tobacco and weed. It's S-P-L-I-F-F. -F. No, it's just true. I've, I've smoked them before. They're pretty good. It is all about acronym. marijuana. <laughs> oh, I see the acronym. Got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was that not... That wasn't yeah. obvious to me. That's why I the kept doubling down on the split. spliff definition over here. I apologize. No, it's not your fault. I'm oh. just an idiot. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a lot of going over our heads here. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, um, if you have a trippy, comedic, documentary, parody, mindfuck film about pot as a pleasure or medicine... Uh, submit your film to spliffffilmfest.com. The deadline is March 5th. I'm only talking about this because it was reported in The Stranger. I don't 
think it's a local thing. Is it not local? I can't. I. Uh, what the fuck was that? Split is a film festival by stoners for stoners. Maybe that's why I can't find anything on the website. It's very colorfully. Uh, it's it's it super beautiful. fun to look at. It not gonna lie. Beautiful. It's kind of like uh, you know psychedelic rock uh, themed a little bit. Not not quite as detailed, but you know. Their, their logo is sort of like you're you're looking at uh, Decemberist or something it's like that. Associated with the Savage Love Cast. Like Savage <laughs> Love Cast, yeah. Yeah. I could see them in their hippie van right now. In any case, you know what we need just to just to bring it around to politics, just like everything, mm. is we need libertarian film festivals or libertarian art festivals in general. Yes, we do, and I will participate in all of them. So this should happen. It's got to be a thing, guys. Like, call me. Yep. If you want to do this, mm -hmm. I will do it with you. Banana phone. Doop, doop. I don't know what that is. You're not familiar with the banana, banana phone song? Are we talking about the bananas that wore pajamas? No, no, this is a whole song. I'll, I'll, it's, it's a ring, 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 banana phone. Do, 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 do. It's a great song. I'll show it to you. Well, we'll, uh, we'll record us doing that and put it in the Patreon. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> uh, last but not least, Attack of the Murder Hornets documentary. Uh, it follows the Washington State Department of Agriculture's hunt for Asian giant hornets. It can be streamed now on Discovery+. Plus. I'm so, dude, I didn't realize. I'm so excited. When I saw this, uh, I did not realize it was going to be just such a, a great uh, documentary. I didn't yeah. realize it was a documentary at all. Because I, I only read the headlines. You see, that's my job is to only read the headlines. So. Oh, yeah. I really don't have anything else for you. Does it? Don't forget to like and subscribe. Leave a comment below of uh, where you want me to eat this week. Because I want to eat somewhere. Yes. Do it. Do it. Do it. LPKingCandy.com. Thanks. Bye. Bye.